Hello, the internet, and welcome to Open Source Directions, hosted by Quantsight, the webinar that brings you all of your all of the news about your favorite open source projects. My name is Anthony Skopatz, your host for Open Source Directions, and co-hosting with me today is Carol. Hi, folks. I'm Carol Willing. I'm an active member of the Jupyter and Python communities, and I am absolutely thrilled to have an opportunity to talk about TensorFlow with my good friend Paige, who just does amazing work in many different areas. So um, welcome, Paige. Thank you. And I am Paige Bailey, a TensorFlow developer advocate working at Google, just recently started a few months ago, um, and based in Mountain View. So really excited to tell you today all about TensorFlow and TensorFlow 2.0. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Paige. So before we get into all the juicy details of TensorFlow, we're going to hear some mixed headlines slash tweets of the week. So. Uh, Paige, do you have something that you'd like to share or a couple things you'd like to share with us today? Absolutely. So so I think um, I, I can sh go ahead and share my screen. Is that correct? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Sure. Course. So I got to spend um, I got to spend a bit of time this week at GTC, um, which is the GPU technology conference that um, that was happening in the Bay Area. Uh, so enable screen sharing. And there we go. So there and screen. Whoa. Show. But um, but uh, I got to attend GTC and one of the first announcements that they had on day one was something called Galgan. Um, and if everybody can see what's happening, um, what's happening there is it's like MS Paint on steroids, kind of. It's like you have um, you have the ability to draw these objects, um, so just these uh, these sort of abstract geometrical shapes. Um, select what kind of style transfer you'd like to have applied to it, and it uses GANs in order to generate a photorealistic image. So you can do it with um, you know these seascapes. Um, they had a great example of waterfalls with with trees, um, but it's really just the coolest thing. Uh, and it's all created. Uh, there's the example with with waterfalls, but it's all wow. using um, deep learning neural networks, um, especially uh, and or in particular generative adversarial networks. So I thought that was really rad. And then the the other thing that was really really cool is that while GTC was happening in the Bay Area, GDC was also happening in the Bay Area, um, <laughs> which wasn't confusing at all. <laughs> And uh, but that was the gaming technology conference. So the GPU people who care about games and the gaming people who care about GPUs, they were in the same place all at once. And one of the biggest announcements there was something from Google uh, called Stadia, which is uh, this this sort of live stream experience for gaming, sort of Netflix for gaming. And you would be able to go on YouTube, um, watch like uh, watch a Bioshock playthrough or something. Um, click a link and then immediately be launched into the gaming experience. And so the the actual action would be happening on some sort of high end GPU enabled box in a, on a server farm somewhere. Um, and you would just be streaming to your phone or streaming to your lo uh, low end laptop or whatever. So uh, it's a super, um, super excellent past week for gaming and for GPUs. And that's that's my announcements. That's the thing I'm excited about this week. Oh Excellent. God. Yeah, they're both really exciting. So I'm my gears are turning. Like, okay, how can we <laughs> use this all in education, mm -hmm. particularly yeah. to get folks interested in science? So, um, yeah. So my tweet is actually um, about an IEEE article that came out about Scott Shawcroft, who is the lead developer on Circuit Python. And um, CircuitPython, for those folks that aren't uh, familiar with it, it's actually running uh, Python on embedded systems. So um, as much as I love C, um, you can also use Python on these, these boards, which I think is going to be really a cool intersection over time, especially with some of the stuff that TensorFlow is doing. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. For my tweet this week, uh, I'd like to tweet Eric Bray, or Iguana Nut on Twitter, who says, Love after all these years later, or love that all these years later, uh, Greg Wilson's Wolfman and Dracula are still collaborating remotely on plans for their Mars base. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with that, that's a software carpentry reference from many, many, many moons ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it was brought some delight to my heart to see that on Twitter. That's so, true. well, 
at this point, we're going to go ahead and dive into our discussion of TensorFlow and just give a small introduction. So TensorFlow, if you're not already familiar with it, it is an open source machine learning library for research and production. It's got about 123,000 stars on GitHub and about 41 million downloads across uh, both PyPI and uh, Conda, Conda, I believe. And that was confirmed as of the last TensorFlow Developer Summit, uh, which was just a couple of weeks ago. So with that uh, in <laughs> intro being said, we have some questions for you, Paige, and we'll just go ahead and uh, ask them back and forth and have cool. a little, little discussion. Um, so. That's quite a lot of downloads. And um, maybe you could tell us a little bit why the project started and what need it fills or needs for that matter. Absolutely. So it, it's one of my favorite open source stories, to be honest. Um, uh, TensorFlow was being used in various iterations in Google internally um, for about, um, well, for about the last decade and a half, really. Uh, so it, it was called something um, like disbelief. Uh, so very punny. Um, and it, it evolved into it evolved into TensorFlow, right? So every every application that you're using um, that is uh, that incorporates AI in some way and comes from Google. So your Gmail, um, search, photos, um, all of that great stuff. Um, if it's using an algorithm, that algorithm would be TensorFlow. So it was very very valuable to us internally. We saw a lot of great returns from it. Um, we we really enjoyed using it. We we built this sort of uh, very stable production system um, in order to deploy the machine learning models effectively. And then at some point about three years ago, uh, this guy named Jeff Dean, who's kind of like the Chuck Norris of deep learning, um, <laughs> but, and I'm being serious, they're like Chuck Norris quotes for him. But he's also the director of Google AI um, and Google Brain. Um, he he decided that it would uh, sort of be beneficial to the world and to us too um, to to take it and to open source it. So to take TensorFlow um, to make it so that it wasn't connected in particular to any of these internal sensitive Google um, you know systems, so that we could safely open source it. Um, and then we did. And there, we, I don't think anybody kind of expected to see the, the sort of interest and excitement that it generated in the community. Um, but everybody, you know, Hacker News exploded and, uh, you know, GitHub started getting a lot of activity and people started starring it all over the place. I have, a, I have a slide deck a little bit later that I can share and show you all of the locations in the world that people are actually using it. Um, and it, it's it's just very, uh, very cool to see. And the library is intended to be not just for deep learning, um, but for any sort of numerical computation that you would be interested in doing. So if you want to use it um, for boosted trees, if you want to use it for logistic regression or linear regression, um, you 100% can. You can even use it for, um, you know, sort of the more uh, ODE type uh, numerical modeling. Uh, that's around. So TensorFlow, uh, like I said, hugely beneficial to Google. Um, and uh, there was just this desire to share it with the world. And yeah. it's it's amazing to see how that ecosystem has grown um, and to see how the communities contributed to it over the last few years. That's, it's really taken off. So yeah. with, with that being said, are there alternative projects to TensorFlow out there in the open source world or in the non open There always world. are, right? There always are, right, yeah. <laughs> and, and so um, so there are, um, but in terms of, uh, so there are, but the TensorFlow organization, if you look at it on GitHub, so github.com slash TensorFlow, it has about 80 sub repos. Uh, so lots and lots of projects that are, that are kind of hap happening under the TensorFlow umbrella. Um, so you have core TensorFlow, which again is, is sort of the numerical modeling, um, the, the sort of heart of everything that's, that's being distributed. And then um, you also have projects like uh, TensorFlow.js, um, which is uh, sort of deep learning in the browser where you can train and you can also do inferencing on, in browsers or even on servers now. Um, they, in, they included Node.js bindings. Um, you have TensorFlow Lite, which allows you to deploy models to mobile devices and to embedded devices. So um, things that are like the size of your fingernail. Um, and uh, you also have things like TF Federated, you have, um, which, which is uh, sort of secure 
um, uh, ensuring that you have data privacy as you're doing um, machine learning modeling. And you have things like TensorFlow probability, which is all sorts of Bayesian, uh, Bayesian tools um, that allow you to do probabilistic deep learning. Uh, so, so tons and tons of projects, sub projects. Um, they all are technically TensorFlow. Uh, so, so I so I think that um, so I think that there are probably other open source tools um, that would that would meet the needs of some parts of the ecosystem, um, but uh, but probably not anything that that is the entire big box. Um, so so some examples that you might have heard of. Uh, there's obviously PyTorch, which is a product, uh, another open source product that allows you to do deep learning. There's Chainer. Right. Um, there's MXNet. There's um, uh, there's uh, if you're just doing traditional machine learning modeling, which TensorFlow can do, um, but with GPUs and TPUs, if you wanted to use GPUs and TPUs as well, um, uh, then Scikit-Learn would be an option. Um, if you wanted to do um, easy um, sort of uh, data ingestion, like I'm sh I'm sure that there are uh, there are equivalent packages within R that allow you to so just uh, install that packages um, or um, the the library open parentheses data or whatever it's called um, that that's a similar idea to to some of the data sets that we have within TensorFlow, um, making them easily ingestible and automatically structured in the format that you would be using for machine learning. That nice the rectangular thing. Um, so yeah, so there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of projects um, out there. They're all they all have uh, you know fantastic communities, fantastic capabilities. Um, but there, I don't think that there's anything that's the the whole big box of, of TensorFlow. Wow, thanks cool. for that very in depth answer. <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, I wax poetic about it for forever. Like that is. Um, but I, I, I really um, I'm excited to work on it. And there's a lot to talk about. Yep. So maybe shifting gears, let's talk a little bit about the technology that TensorFlow is built upon or yeah. technologies. Yes. So um, so it's primarily uh, I, I mentioned before that it, uh, it's not just for deep learning, but deep learning is certainly a part. Um, so, so you have a number of tools that allow you to construct um, that allow you to construct neural networks in very straightforward ways. So you might have heard of Keras. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a higher level API that was created um, by a guy named Francois Chalet, who now works at Google. Um, it's uh, TensorFlow has um, sort of that tooling uh, enabled for it, which allows you to create a neural network with about 10 lines of code. And we'll see an example of that a little bit later. Um, digital signal processing. Um, so, in all of this, you have a Python API to do the functionality. Um, we also have a C plus plus API, but I don't really, um, I don't really recommend using it if if you can use the Python API. Um, and the um, yeah, that's sort of the the overall structure. If you have any questions about any of the, um, so if you have a particular task that you're trying to solve. Um, and you're you're confused as to what portion of the API documentation you should go about doing it in. Um, always feel free to ask me questions on Twitter or to send me an email. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Um, but yes, so it's it's primarily it's a Python API. Um, so if you're familiar with Python, you should be pretty happy. Um, but you do have the ability to use a variety of other languages to interact with it. Um, so everything from Rust to I think I mentioned JavaScript already to Java, to C++, and more support for languages are being added every day, including Swift for TensorFlow, which uh, launched a 0.2 version a couple of weeks ago. Right, excellent. So all, all that being said, you, you said like this, is, this came out of Google from a long time ago. Were there particular people who started the TensorFlow project or the, uh, the previous project that it inherited from? Well, it was Jeff Dean, right? Jeff like, Dean. Okay. Yeah. He's Chuck just, Norris. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you, man. Like he's, pretty, <laughs> he is, he is, uh, you know, it's it's like the what's the the quote from Douglas Adams? Like eventually you evolve into this higher being of of blue luminescent light. That is Jeff. Like he, <laughs> he's awesome. 
But um, but yes, yeah, so he um, he and Sanjoy, and there was a, a paper or not a paper, but an article recently released about kind of how they've um, how they've been phenomenal engineers at Google, how they've driven um, so much of the great progress that uh, that the engineering teams have been doing in Google Brain, um, and I can share a link to that as well. Um, but it was also a really interesting. Uh, sort of detailing of, of their friendship and, uh, and about how uh, they're able to um, they're able to work together. It was in the New Yorker, um, nice. just the link, yeah. Um, but they still, it's it's really cool to see they still pair program together, which is <laughs> oh yeah, fun. That's, gr that's great. Very fun. That, yeah. That's that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So a project this size that has so many moving pieces and sub projects, how? Do you maintain a project like that? That's a great question, and the answer is it's very uh, it's very difficult to do. Um, it's especially difficult in that you have um, so obviously internal teams working on TensorFlow, mm -hmm. um, but there's also a vibrant and huge and always growing um, external community that's doing phenomenal work. Uh, so so something that we've started last year. Um, was adopted from kind of the Kubernetes community, if y'all have familiarity mm -hmm. with that. Um, but we have the, yeah, so we have these things called RFCs. Mm -hmm. um, and so any changes to the API, um, no matter whether they happen or are proposed internally or externally, um, you have to submit a design document. That design document has to be placed on GitHub um, and announced and opened for review for a couple of weeks. So people can make comments, suggestions, um, sort of file complaints. Um, and there's a great dialogue that forms around that. We also have um, sort of special interest groups, mm -hmm. uh, mailing lists, and uh, sort of Google group forum spaces where people can uh, meet to talk about um, uh, different functionalities. So we have one for Swift, we have one for TF Lite, we have one for TensorFlow Probability, we have one for TensorFlow.js, we have one specifically for testing and migration support, we have one for, um, oh gosh, documentation. Like there, there are all sorts of special interest groups um, that, have, that have sprung up organically. Uh, uh, we have um, Gitter channels, um, where people can communicate, uh, but not in an overwhelming way. Uh, Gitter is kind of a yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, like I, I get overwhelmed very easily by uh, there. There were some channels in Slack, uh, in Slack instances that I've been involved with in the past that were like these barrages of gifts, um, and and they're fantastic. Like I love it, but it's also like oh my gosh, like that's. That's well, you would spend your whole day just reading like chat channels and not get Absolutely. anything done. Absolutely, and and so so the Gitter um, Gitters feels a little bit more like Freenode or IRC um, if you're mm -hmm. if you're one of those if you and so so much less uh, much less fire hosey, um, but uh, yes, and we also have biweekly or monthly or even weekly for the testing group meetings. Um, so we can all kind of get together virtually and have face-to-face, -face, um, and that's internal Google engineers, but also more importantly, the community. Uh, so all of these different options. We also have the TensorFlow Dev Summit, which is uh, happened a couple of weeks ago and is kind of our, our uh, get together for core committers, special interest group leaders, um, uh, TensorFlow engineers, those sorts of things. Um, we are. We just recently announced a conference called TensorFlow World, uh, which will be happening in late October. So, if anybody has any interesting TensorFlow projects that they'd like to submit, we would love to see them, and we would love to have you submit a call for proposal. Um, we have, uh, yeah. So, so that's the the majority of the ways that people communicate and make sure that there's sort of cross collaboration within all of these. Um, all of these sub repos. It's a dialogue mainly happens through those special interest groups, through RFCs that are placed on GitHub in the community section. So github.com slash tensorflow slash community. And then also uh, just GitHub in general. Like, all my friends hang out on GitHub. So, uh, <laughs> so if, you, if you just like read through and comment on issues that you know, like you learn people's personalities pretty quick. That's absolutely true. Um, 
just to, if I'm curious, because with a project this size, it's hard to keep up to date on the technical things that are coming down or important things of the moment. Is there a best place to go look? Well, probably the TensorFlow website. Okay. Um, and and uh, so tensorflow.org, we just recently revitalized it. Um, so now we have um, we have like an announcements section um, and all of the the sort of biggest uh, TensorFlow uh, announcements are, are placed there. Um, and I also strongly suggest subscribing to the announcements uh, mailing list for TensorFlow. Good tip. And then, yeah, and then uh, so all of the big big things uh, get announced through there, and then also uh, the discuss at and the developers at TensorFlow mailing lists are very good. The first is for general questions about the, the ecosystem and its products. And then the developers at is really just intended to be for very, very technical design discussions about the TensorFlow core API. Fascinating. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. So where do your communities of users and contributors outside of Google come from typically where where I mean you've gotten all this uptick so it seems yeah. like the whole world is using TensorFlow sometimes so that's can I quote you on that like that's a that's a yeah. thank you thanks, sure. <laughs> thanks for saying it, but you're right it, it does feel that way and then it's really interesting too um, and that the deep learning community just in general over the past three years has gone from you know this very academic ivory tower situation to like, hey, I can build a model with 10 lines of code, deploy it and put it on my cell phone uh, sort of thing. So so people are starting to use, uh, application developers are starting to use it in their apps. And um, you know, kids are starting to build self-driving robot cars. And uh, <laughs> you know, like robot wars would have been so much more interesting um, <laughs> when we were kids, if, if we could have used deep learning. But the um, but yeah so so the communities the spaces that our users are coming from it is everything from these academic use cases so people who are writing you know serious CS research who are all about getting like the latest and greatest two percent incremental performance in whatever new cool model or new image uh, new image recognition task. Um, but we also have application developers, so both mobile and web application developers who are just wanting to take a model that's been created um, and use it within their app. So a quintessential example is if you use Snapchat and it uh, and you have one of those filters that like puts a dog face on a people face right. and so you have the, the ears and the nose. Um, that's technically, you know, it's using, uh, it might be using deep learning in order to determine specific locations on a face um, or to be able to modify your face in some way. Um, but you're probably just wanting to be able to apply that model instead of going about creating it yourself, right? So, so that, um, that was kind of the flow.js and TensorFlow Lite and even these higher level APIs. I think Paige's internet may have dropped temporarily. Oh, oh the, no, you're back. Okay, perfect. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. perfect. I have no idea what happened. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. But the, no but yeah, so TensorFlow.js, TensorFlow Lite, um, that was kind of the motivation to be able to give web application developers and mobile application developers the ability to, um, the ability to use these tools um, without necessarily, um, without necessarily uh, being able to, uh, uh, you know, create the the overall model themselves, and then we also see researchers outside of CS, so people in physics, people in chemistry, people in biology, who are um, people who are using deep learning techniques to further their science. Uh, so, so that space is really cool. But then there's also artists. And there are also musicians um, who are using who are using deep learning in order to generate like synthetic rose petals that they can use for um, for these detailed visual art displays. Or oh, cool, yeah. Or to generate um, like they they'll create a melody like strum it out on a guitar and then automatically have a drum accompaniment or or something of that nature. So I think Carol, you were mentioning the Google Doodle yesterday, where you just. Oh. 
trace out a couple notes and then it gives you like a four part um, Baki, uh, Baki sort of music thing. Um, and then there are also uh, people who are using it um, for uh, journalism purposes. So being able to audit synopses of uh, news events that are happening. So instead of having to come up with the lead paragraph for, uh, for any sort of uh, article that you would write, it's automatically generated for you. Like it's, it's like, there are infinite use cases. Um, so, and, and all of those communities, uh, so they're using TensorFlow in a variety of ways, um, but obviously they, they're coming at it from different perspectives. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but it's 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 just like an explosion outside of outside of computer science, outside of academia in general, outside of even uh, the programming space. You know, like mobile and web application developers, um, and into into art, into music, into all of these sort of other um, other great use cases. Very cool. Um, so, you know when a project expands as quickly as TensorFlow has or Jupyter had, um, it can be hard to be inclusive of many different cultures, um, communities, and what is TensorFlow doing in the area of diversity and inclusion? That's another really, really great question. Um, so so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow is used globally. So we have this great visualization um, of all of the, the sort of locations that people have uh, been uh, starring uh, TensorFlow on GitHub. Um, and it really is everywhere, including Antarctica. And I don't know what the Antarctica person is doing other than like deep learning on penguins or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, there, there, are a ton of, um, there are a ton of locations that it's being used. Uh, and we we have a strong presence um, in China, so we have a TensorFlow engineering team based there. We get to do a lot of wonderful um, sort of hack camps in China. Um, so to make sure that uh, so partnerships with universities and sort of these organic um, live stream events that happen simultaneously with the Dev Summit. Um, and just in general hackathons. Jeff Dean, that guy I was mentioning before, he went to go speak at a conference called Deep in Daba, uh, which is <laughs> in Africa. Um, it's uh, it's uh, sort of taking all of the, the researchers there, the deep learning researchers from prominent universities um, in one location, having them talk about their research and having a huge collection of people just learn from each other. And it's a fantastic experience. It started off with just one event and it spawned off into um, sort of these Indaba X experiences all across Africa. Um, and we just recently also announced a Google Brain office in Africa. Um, so so offices, um, offices globally. Um, we also have an office in India, you know, several in Europe. Um, and uh, just sort of making sure that uh, no, no particular part of the world feels um, feels marginalized or like they don't have access to the tools um, that would make them successful um, for deep learning. Um, we also have a number of AI ethics projects. That's um, awesome. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah great. So, so um, the uh, Google has. Uh, let me pull up a link to this. So we have something called Pair. Um, it's people in AI research, and it's human-centered research and design to make AI partnerships productive, enjoyable, and fair. Um, and this is and and this is something that every single AI project at Google has to go through, um, like a, a very strict review to ensure that it's being equitable to any any um, sort of group that's that's part of the project. So that's um, that's the effort located within Google. We also have something called the what if tool, um, which is again created with TensorFlow, um, but it allows you to inspect a machine learning model visually um, to look at any potential, um, any potential problematic, uh, problematic um, sort of um, biases towards the groups that are being included. So, uh, um, I love this tool. It's created using something called TensorBoard. 
uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to join the TensorFlow team. And just, I, I think, enhanced tooling like this. We also have um, a literature publication um, called the Still Pub, which goes through and is all about explaining machine learning in straightforward, understandable, interactive ways um, that are that are also freely hosted on Google Colab instances. So it's not really limiting the, the access to any of the people who would be able to use it. Um, just ensuring that uh, ensuring that folks know how they would be able to go about inspecting their models if they have any questions at all about how it's making its decisions. And that's so important um, because I, I'm sure we've all uh, we've all read the the great book about how um, you know sometimes there are biases and um, and algorithms. You know, deep learning or not, like whatever algorithm right. you're using, there's there's bias. Um, so just to make sure that we're we're at least uh, sort of knowledgeable about what kind of biases we could see is huge. Very cool. Excellent. Well. At this point, why don't we shift and go into our demo section, if you have a couple of demos that you could give relatively briefly, <laughs> Paige, I know, like, oh, um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so demos I could do, I could also do, um, I could also kind of show, um, and I guess the, the presentation deck does have a couple of demos. So let's. Yeah. Why don't we dive into that then? And, yeah. So yeah. I will, I will show the presentation deck. Um, and then I will show a couple of, a couple of JavaScript examples if we have time. And okay, also, nice. yeah, and also, um, we, uh, if you're curious as well, you could go check out the Google Doodle from yesterday. I think it's it's still um, still hosted somewhere. So, um, Chrome tab and share. So, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes. Excellent. Um, so, I will go ahead and present. Um, and uh, this is, uh, so this is the visualization that I was telling you about before. All of the locations that people um, have starred TensorFlow's repo from around the world. Um, and, and like I said, including that, that guy in Antarctica who, who nobody quite knows what he's, uh, you know, like, like I said, deep learning on penguins. Um, but it's, it's been kind of a, a sort of a whirlwind of a ride over the last few years. 41 million downloads, 50,000 plus commits. Um, to the repo on GitHub, 9,900 pull requests, 1,800 contributors, um, so far and away more than the Google TensorFlow engineering team. Um, all of this has just happened, um, and uh, we're, we're excited to see sort of the engagement and excitement from the community. And then that was kind of the roadmap of, of what we've done to date. Um, so we, we announced it in November of 2015, um, you know, we we added all of these um, all of these great things like Keras integration, eager execution. So Keras is directly embedded within the TensorFlow API now as tf.keras. We have all of this extended tooling like TF Hub, TensorFlow JS, TFX, which is the end-to-end -end, um, machine learning deployment framework. Um, CUDA support. So Lorena would probably be very excited. Um, to, to see that, but that was uh, announced, you know, sort of mid 2016, um, and big table integration and so forth. Um, and then we've used it in Google in a, in a variety of ways, right? So we've used uh, TensorFlow to improve the efficiency of our data centers and our power consumption. We've used it for global localization with Google Maps. Um, so I think that uh, you know there there was the Fox example for Google Maps that was shown a little while ago, where you can have this augmented reality um, experience as you're walking along, and then also portrait mode for Google Pixel. So being able to give you all of these image modification tools um, as you're just using your mobile device. And if you um, if you also have an Android device, you might have seen recently um, that with the latest update. Um, suddenly speech to text is much faster. Um, so instead of having to ping a server somewhere um, in order to generate the text that's being used as you speak, um, you're, you're just getting a response immediately. And that's because a TensorFlow light model for speech to text was deployed directly on device. So now instead of you having to ping a server somewhere, 
um, you're just using your phone as an inferencing tool and a models directly on your phone, um, which is pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I, I find the cool. TensorFlow light stuff very impressive, actually. It's, yeah. it's really amazing, some of the stuff yeah. that's being done there. Yeah, TensorFlow light and the the amount that they're able to to sort of reduce the size of models, um, so to quantize and prune it into a um, into a state where it can get on, you know, just one of those little like uh, I think Pete Warden was calling it blue pills in his talk, but one of the little coral um, tiny tiny USB devices for inferencing. It's huge, um, and then so this is an example of a code pen um, using Magenta. Uh, created by this guy named uh, Tiro Parvanian um, that that allows you to to kind of go through and generate um, generate music in different styles and with different custom beats, um, just sort of out of the box. And then uh, so this was community created. The ones the examples that I mentioned before those were all created by Google engineers. This was created by somebody you know just uh, just out in the community, which is phenomenal to see. Um, then there's also um, so applications in biomedicine. Um, these these are protein folding experiments. There's a comp there's a competition kind of like the Olympics of protein folding that happens each year. Um, there and and the, yeah right like I didn't know that this was a thing, um, but apparently it, it it exists. And so one of the uh, one of the competitions that they always give is okay well who has the most performant model who has the most accurate one. Um, and DeepMind submitted something called AlphaFold to this competition, um, and it blew away the previous benchmark uh, by just an astronomical amount. So, so being able to um, being able to do uh, things like this um, to be able to apply deep learning techniques that were used to like, you know, uh, train. Um, Sebastian Thrun had a had a great quote that he was able to use a neural network that was trained on pictures of cat and dog faces um, to detect uh, different kinds of cancer. Right, like it's it's just being able to see these, being able to see these uh, sort of cross discipline applications is is huge. And let me um, so given that, and since I've been you know sort of saying nice things about TensorFlow JS. Uh, uh, over and uh, over and over again. Let me let me bounce over to the TensorFlow JS. Um, sure thing. Yeah. Right. So, and this is something that you guys would be able to play with yourself. So you know that I'm not fibbing. Um, but <laughs> I know you're not fibbing. Yeah, but the but the um, but so these are a lot of great examples that are browser-based models that you can explore yourself. And I always like showing this guy. So this is um, this is uh, something uh, that allows you to detect poses um, live within your browser. So I'm going to skip the tutorial um, and let's see if, if this will work. Right. So backing up, and it looks like it does. Oh, right? so we can't actually see the. We see, just see the home page. The we don't see the demo. Oh, you're so so for whatever reason. Um, oh, it might have bounced into a different. It might have bounced into a different tab. So let me um, let me move uh, to. This might be the livest of demos we've ever had. It might so, be the coolest <laughs> too. Um, so not this guy. Uh, let's try. Um, enable screen sharing and um, there we go. And this one should hopefully work. Yep, that's so, it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so this model is running directly in my Chrome tab um, and it's able to detect <laughs> um, it's able to detect the different parts of my body. Um, as well as specific locations on my face. So you can see that it's picking out my eye locations, my ear, my nose. Um, and you can imagine all of the applications that you would be able to do with something like this. So something as cool as being able to do um, sort of outfit placement on a human body um, or eyeglass placement. If you're, if you know, you have an eyeglass store and you want to be able to have um, a web-based experience for people to virtually try on your product. Or um, if you're doing yoga poses, 
right? Like being able to um, being able to have the ability to try it out in front of some sort of video. Um, and if you're doing something wrong, which I obviously always do, <laughs> uh, if I'm doing yoga or if I'm trying to lift weights terribly, um, being able to highlight preferentially areas where you have bad posture on, on your body so that you're immediately alert and, and that you don't do something that might be potentially dangerous. Um, so so that is, um, that's an example of, of a TensorFlow.js model. Um, there are also other, uh, there are also other really cool things to see. So let right. me. Well, we should probably leave the demos off there. So we have a little bit of time for roadmap yeah. and, and Q and A, but that was extremely impressive. That's really cool. It's yeah. Very neat to see. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, at this point we we're going to dive into sort of a roadmap discussion. So once again, this is for, uh, places, places where TensorFlow is going and uh, sort of what the what the future of TensorFlow is. I know there was a, just a, the big developer summit that was kind of all on this topic. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, this is a location again, or th these are areas where if people want to contribute to TensorFlow or any of the parts of TensorFlow that they could jump in and and uh, and help out with with the various pieces for whatever pet project that they, they might have. And you're, you may be, more actively seeking contribution. So keep that in mind. And then uh, where is TensorFlow going? Absolutely. So the um, the where is TensorFlow going? Kind of everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. So, browser, uh, <laughs> yeah. so so TensorFlow, um, we, we just recently announced an alpha version of TensorFlow 2.0 a couple of weeks ago. And TensorFlow 2.0, is focused on developer productivity, ease of use, and then also building um, machine learning models that you can deploy anywhere. So any platform, um, train it on a variety of, of sort of hardware architectures. Uh, so if you tried to use TensorFlow in 2015, when we first initially open sourced it, um, not gonna lie, it was pretty painful. Like it's, uh, I, I tried it like whenever the, the deep dream, uh, the deep dream buzz was happening. Um, I tried using it for a couple of pet projects and it was like 300 lines of boilerplate code in order to do anything useful. And it also didn't feel very Pythonic. And the only experience I had had with machine learning prior to that was scikit-learn, which is delightful. You right. know, it's, it's like five lines and then you can do magic things. and. Um, pandas is kind of the same way, right? Like it's, you know, you have trade-offs, but the developer experience is actually very nice. Um, and so TensorFlow was left without all of the, the sort of higher level tooling. Um, and most of it was like low level operations, which is great if you're, you know, sort of like used to working on a low level, but most data scientists, most data analysts aren't really. Um, so, so since then, uh, I mentioned Keras before, and that uh, uh, feels more like scikit-learn, 10 lines to do something useful. Um, and so, so we've moved to Keras as the default um, higher level API. It's our recommendation for any user. So if you're getting started or if you're using TensorFlow in any capacity, we recommend using Keras. Um, we give you Keras, uh, sort of the, the 10 line, super simple thing, um, but also the ability to subclass, which means that you can get lower level control on your deep learning models. Um, mm -hmm. And that you're also able to, to have the kind of granularity that you need for research purposes. And if you still need access to even lower level operations, we still expose all of the raw ops for you to use too. Um, so, but again, being able to be a beginner, a sort of middling experienced person or a, or a really hardcore researcher, um, we're trying to give everybody sort of that access. Um, we're also building out performance for CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. I think that we saw like a 1.8 um, uh, performance gain for training for GPUs with this latest version. Um, similar speed up for inferencing when using um, uh, automatic mixed precision from NVIDIA um, and also um, sort of perform uh, performance enhancements for TPUs as well, though we don't have TPU support yet for TensorFlow 2.0. Um, and also I, I mentioned before that you have the ability to deploy models to different 
um, different kinds of environments that maybe weren't historically a space where you would expect to see deep learning. Uh, so browsers, um, little embedded devices, um, look for more of that as well. Um, so we're going to be building out the programs for TensorFlow.js, um, for TensorFlow Lite. We have the ability to embed TensorBoard within Colab notebooks and Jupyter notebooks now. Um, so instead of having to do this local host 6006 shenanigans, like yeah. you can have it in a, in a nice, you know, uh, a, an environment that you're familiar with. Um, right. cool. Yeah, and so. If, if folks wanted to help out in any of these areas, how would they get started or, or right. what would they do? Yeah. So, so, they, so anybody can help, we would be delighted to have <laughs> help. Holy moly, there are not enough, you know, like I, I, I don't think that we, like, I, I will, nobody will ever turn down an open source contributor. <laughs> 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 So, um, so the special interest groups that I was mentioning before, which you can see all listed at github.com slash tensorflow slash community, um, you can get involved with the TensorBoard SIG, the TensorFlow Lite uh, mailing list, the, um, the TensorFlow JS mailing list, um, and they all have very vibrant, uh, vibrant communities, not just for um, developing the API. So if you want to help with that, like, whoa, Amazing, but also if you just want to like create a cool example and share it, um, that's uh, that's a great thing that we would love to see as well. Um, or blog about it, or you know, help with documentation, or you know, like uh, uh, do really cool graphic design work, or uh, you know, speak about it at a conference, or teach <laughs> class, or you know, write a song, I don't care. Like, <laughs> whatever way that you want to contribute, all of them are special and valuable and awesome, and we would be delighted to have any. Yeah, that's very that, cool. Excellent. Carol, any uh, questions on the roadmap? Uh, just um, TensorFlow Lite. Um, does, how many different boards does it work on now, or just the Spark Fun one, or many? Yeah. So it works on pretty much, uh, It work, there's a full list of hardware on its website, but it oh, works cool. on a variety of things, right? So it's not just the SparkFun board. It's also Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's also um, like they're, they're putting it on Arduinos, I think. The, um, they're, they're doing it, uh, like you can put it on mobile devices and it's not just like Google phone mobile devices. It's like lots and lots of cell phones um, provided that they have support for um, for whatever um, like the the hardware support that's needed, um, but variety of locations. So people have been people have been using TensorFlow Lite in a lot of different ways, um, and the the Raspberry Pi stuff. I remember again, I tried to put a TensorFlow model um, on Raspberry Pi like before TensorFlow Lite was a thing, and it was terrible. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You had to do really, really questionable shenanigans with memory management, and then like your board was borked, and it was it was really bad. Um, but now it's it's much better. So, <laughs> so strongly suggest if you're doing Raspberry Pi things and you want to deploy deep learning models on them, like make sure that it's TensorFlow Lite and not and not like TensorFlow proper that you're attempting to that you're attempting to train on a Raspberry Pi. That's a good pro tip. Um, I think we're going to go to Q&A now, right? Is that right, Anthony? That's right. That's right. So we've had one question come in so far from Hamir. Um, and Hamir asks, are there plans to support Metal or officially support the Rock M, support Rock M, the latter of which has already been upstreamed, so as not to force people to use CUDA when doing GPU-based stuff? That is a great question, and I unfortunately don't have the answer, but I will <laughs> pop over to GitHub uh, to see if somebody has already asked that question, because I, I guarantee you um, that there's uh, there's probably um, there's probably a, a interest around that, and it's probably filed as an issue. Um, Sounds but, good. I mean, we can yeah. follow up with uh, Hamir in a bit. Uh, yeah. if as needed, so, or as we get the answer, I suppose. And are there any other questions from the viewers? We haven't had any come in, so going so once, I, going twice. I, so. I, see, um, I see a merged pull request um, to introduce support for the Rockem platform to TensorFlow. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, I, can, I can put a link to that here. 
Um, Excellent. But, yeah, but the um, but yeah, so so that is um, sort of the um, the idea behind it. And like I said, it's the the team. Um, if you if you notice a gap. Uh, especially on these these platforms that are popular externally, um, but not necessarily internally. Uh, like the just file an issue and say like, "Hey man, I need this. Like, why on earth are you not supporting this yet?" And for the most part, like the engineering teams just, "Oh, well, we didn't know that was a thing." Like, okay, let's let's go and let's find a way to to add additional support or to prioritize it in some way. Um, so if you have a if you have a recommendation for a design change, um, just file an issue, um, and if it's uh, and if it gets kind of good dialogue around the issue, then file an RFC. Um, Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. At this point, it is now time for our world famous rant section, where we each get fifteen seconds to rant about whatever topic we want. So, Paige, it is your soapbox. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. So. Um, <laughs> So I think I mentioned before uh, that I kind of I come from the scikit-learn world um, or the SciPy community, the PyData community, and one of the things that I always loved about it was that it felt like there were all always these sort of natural, organic, um, but also cross-disciplinary venues for people to talk, um, and it didn't it didn't feel awkward at all. So like uh, SciPy, for example, it's one of my favorite conferences. And you get people there from industry, but also from academia, but also from all of these other different walks of life. Um, and everybody there uh, sort of has a, a common um, common standing, common understanding, and, and can sort of explain their projects. And um, it feels very friendly, like, like folks are talking to each other. Um, and and I, also, um, I also kind of love the focus on developer productivity and, and also developer facing tooling. So making that experience delightful, um, you know, like making programming for uh, making uh, the code for humans <laughs> um, and then and then doing whatever needs to happen on the back end to make it work for computers. Um, and, and I think that it would be great to um, and I haven't really seen that in the deep learning community. Like I've seen, I've seen academic um, academic groups that interact with each other, and you know, are very focused on reading the latest papers and you know, producing the latest research. But then for the the newer users, the ones who are just exploring how to use it for their research outside of CS or their um, their cool art project or their cool music thing or whatever, um, I haven't really seen. Uh, much of that space, and I especially haven't seen much uh, sort of discussion for natural sciences groups like the earth sciences or physics or chemistry or whatever um, who who want to get together but who don't necessarily have a background in heavy duty programming. Right. Um, so yeah, so I would love to see um, kind of a sci-fi ish uh, deep learning um, deep learning group. Uh, and, and especially focused on giving, you know, traditional scikit-learn pandas folks um, the tooling and the the sort of upskilling needed in order to uh, to sort of get uh, deep learning concepts into their into their wheelhouse and into their toolbox. Excellent. If that makes any sort of sense at all, <laughs> it makes a lot of great sense. And SciPy is definitely a place where you get a lot of interesting people coming together who want to change the world in a positive way too. So I think that's something that's really nice. Um, you done with your rant? Should I go down to mine? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my rant. <laughs> go for it, Carol. Um, I, my rant this week is meetings without an agenda or a specific purpose, especially if they <laughs> last for an hour yeah. or longer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, those are oh my those are so painful. <laughs> like, be kind to your fellow humans. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, for my rant today, and I've said it before, pigments. Pigments has about five <laughs> different ways to define a lexer, making it really confusing to know which tool to use at any given time. You really don't need the whole dynamic language tool kitchen sink 
uh, for effectively what is a parser generator. That's all the time that we have for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Quantsite AI. If you're interested in funding open source projects, including TensorFlow, you can find all of the project roadmaps at Quantsite.com slash projects. Paige, where can people find you and TensorFlow? I am a dynamic web page all over the internet and uh, and also web page at google.com. Excellent, okay. thanks. And I hope I don't sound stochastic when I say this, but please join us again next time for our PyMC3 episode. <laughs> Another Bye, <bad> everybody. <laughs> Bye, Paige, thank you so much. Thank you, Paige, it was a real pleasure.